Hey, welcome back to Antisocial Studies teachers. Today we're going to talk about HIP or Hippie or Hippo or HAP or Happy or AP Parts or whatever acronym you use to teach this thing. So I use HIP just because it goes exactly with the way the College Board phrases it on the rubric for the DBQ. So HIP is essentially a way of evaluating sources or evaluating documents and it stands for Historical Situation, Intended Audience, Purpose, or Point of View. And I want to emphasize or, right? I mean, students will never be asked on a DBQ or on a test to do all four of these for a document. And I will just say to new teachers, I wouldn't ask them to do that. I made that mistake my first few years where we would get a doc and I would say, okay, go through all four of these. Do H, I, P, and P. And it got really discouraging for the kids because on any given document, there's probably at least one of these that is not very obvious. Um, and so you want to instead get them used to just picking the one they think they have the best answer for. Um, I a lot of people ask them to do two. I'll say pick two out of the four if we're doing it for practice. Um, and then we kind of discuss which one do you think is the strongest? Okay, that's the one you would want to include in an essay. Because I've graded a lot of essays of kids who try to like do H, I, P, and P for like every document and they run out of time or they don't do any of them well enough to get the point. So anyway, um, when do I introduce this to my students? I mean, informally, I introduce this on day one. Um, anytime we're looking at a document, I'm asking them questions that are related to HIP. I don't tell them or teach them the acronym yet because honestly, the first two months of AP World are like just all the acronyms and it's really overwhelming and kind of meaningless to kids. So I save this one. But if we're looking at any sort of document, I'll say like, okay, who made this document? Well, what do we know about that person? Are they biased in any way? Why might this document be problematic or be super helpful or whatever? So you can kind of lead them through these questions without having to formally teach the acronym like the first week of school, which is why I'm just now talking about it now. Whenever I do teach them the acronym of HIP, I start with modern documents because students overthink this all the time. They think it's way harder than it really is. And honestly, most students are hipping stuff all day, every day. Like as they're scrolling through social media, they are subconsciously hipping stuff. Uh, a lot of times I'll have them pull up like an influencer's post on Instagram and they hip it. And so they might talk about the intended audience. Well, let's look at the hashtags they're using. What audience are they trying to attract with this? Uh, the purpose. Well, this lady's selling supplements. And if you click on the link, oh, they're her supp supplements that she sells. So of course she's posting a picture of her like awesome protein shake or whatever. Um, politics is another easy way to introduce HIP. Just depends on how, how much you want to get into politics with your world history class. I do it a lot, but I also, you know, know my kids. I've taught a lot of them for multiple years. So I feel pretty comfortable with that. So I do a lot of like modern political cartoons. I will say the single best document for getting kids to understand all aspects of HIP within like 10 minutes is a presidential tweet. And really you can do a tweet from Obama or Trump, um, but I will say like a Trump tweet, really regardless of your political views, has all the elements of a HIP right there. Um, it's a really great training tool for students because one, it has the timestamp on it. You can see exactly when they tweeted that and you can then talk about the context. Go back and look, was there some big news story that they're maybe referring to? Was a debate going on, blah, blah, blah. Intended audience, you can actually have them just go look at the comments and see who is following this account and like who, who they might be trying to speak to. Purpose and point of view, right? I mean, it, it can all be encapsulated in like one or two sentences of a tweet. And it's something that students are more familiar with. They're familiar with the idea that if you read a post from a celebrity, it might not be totally truthful or it might not be entirely accurate, right? It's their kind of view of something or what they want to put out into the world. But for some reason, when we give them like a 15th century document, they just don't, that all leaves their brain. They're like, oh, well, the queen said it. So I guess this happened. And for some reason, we need to get them to connect those two things together, that there's really nothing different between a presidential tweet and like a letter from the queen, right? So um, when do I introduce it formally? Unit four. Unit four is when I go through and say like, okay, here's the acronym. Let's do some practice with modern documents. And now let's do some practice with documents from unit four. And the reason why I wait till unit four is that by that point, we're kind of well into the class and we've gotten a lot of the basics down. And again, I've been sowing the seeds of this all year, but I haven't been doing it like explicitly with the acronym. 
The other reason is that Unit 4 just has like really biased documents and really problematic documents, right? This is the age of discovery. This is the age of conquistadors in the New World and the New World reacting to conquistadors and the Portuguese showing up in the Indian Ocean and then everyone being like, who are these people? And so almost every document from this unit has some pretty clear like hippable element, right? Either it's intended for someone who's financing your expedition or the point of view is of like a white person in, you know, South America, or, I mean, it's just all very kind of clear to students. And it's a lot easier than, for example, asking them to do hip on like a Silk Road era scroll or something, right? It's just a little bit less complicated. So what is the point? This is an aspect of HIP that I, I think we skip over, and I think it's really important, and it's also the way I've gotten a lot of buy-in from my students to do HIP and to take it seriously, is that, like, yeah, it's the point on the DBQ rubric, but really it's that the College Board wants to see that you can use your own brain and that you can read between the lines of a document. They want to understand that, like, because, again, they're assessing you, like, are you college ready is what they're assessing you. They want to know that you can read a tweet from a politician and not just accept it as 100% fact that you can understand like, oh, okay, well maybe they're speaking to this group and maybe they're saying this for this reason. And so in the same way, they wanna see that you can look at a letter from Columbus and not just take everything Columbus says at like face value. Um, the other thing is that HIP is really to me the most important skill we teach them all year. It is the most transferable to the quote unquote real world, right? Like. Um, and this is where I get parents on board, too. If you have those parents who are like, why does my kid need to know history? They're going to go be an engineer or a doctor or whatever. Um, this is where you can really bring them in and say, like, if nothing else, they need to learn how to look at political documents, um, social documents, like these different things that are happening in the world at these earlier times, but also today, and to be able to evaluate them critically and make sense of them for themselves. And that's what we're really doing. Right. And that's a good way to get parents on board. And it's also a good way to get students on board because a lot of our AP students, at least I found, are very politically literate and they like kind of knowing more about current events. They, they like being treated like an adult. And so this is a way you can get them on board. OK, so really quickly, I just want to go through one example of each of these and kind of show you how I explain each part of HIP, but also identify some of the common mistakes students make. So. The first is historical situation. You can also describe it as the historical context of the document, but just be careful because the biggest pitfall here is that students want to just take the context they've created for the entire essay and they want to just apply it to this document or really to all of their documents. So let's say, you know, we had some, let's make up a fake DBQ about the age of exploration or whatever. Um, and they might've contextualized the age of exploration. They might've talked about the scientific revolution and the trade from China, bringing things like the compass and blah, 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 blah. And they've contextualized their essay. What a lot of kids will do is they'll just sort of recycle that for like every document <laughs> and it's repetitive. And you're like, well, no, that's the context for the whole essay. What they want to know here is they want to know, can you situate this document within its specific conquest, meaning its location, its time frame specifically? And so what I tell kids is I say, OK, if you want to decide if you want to talk about the historical situation of a document, let's look at this portrait of Queen Elizabeth I. It's painted in 1588. I ask kids, do you know what was going on in England in 1588? Some kids say yes, but most kids say no. And I said, okay, if you said no, do you know what was going on in England during Queen Elizabeth's reign? And if they say no, then I'm like, then don't, don't do H for this one. Because that's what they want. And so, you know, you can do varying levels of specificity, but basically what, what students want to do in an ideal world is say, hey, 1588 was the year of the Spanish Armada. That was when Elizabeth defeated the Spanish Armada. And hey, look, there's like ships being sunk in the background and she's looking very you know, proud of herself. She has her hand on the world. There's a mermaid over here. Like there's a lot of elements here. Well, you know what? Like the historical situation is she just defeated what was the most powerful Navy in the world. And so now she is essentially rising and is now the leader of, in theory, the new power on the Atlantic Ocean. And she wants to commemorate this and show people like just how powerful she is and remind everyone of what happened to the Spanish in the background when they tried to, when they tried to overthrow her. 
right? Um, so that's what they want to do with the historical context. And so you want it to be as specific as possible. Now, let's say your kids like don't know that the Spanish Armada was in 1588. Okay, but they should talk about Elizabeth's reign then. They should talk about that she specifically was renaissance and she was sponsoring expeditions. She was sponsoring um, new innovations, that sort of thing. And so like she's trying to promote herself as this worldly ruler and trying to show people that she is kind of capable of putting England on the map, literally, right? And so then you point to the elements in the portrait that do that. So the second one is intended audience. I always tell kids, if you have a letter or a government report or like a memo to an emperor or something, intended audience is a great, is a great candidate. So who's the document meant for when it's created? So this is a letter, or it's actually just a, a part of Columbus's captain's log, where he describes the native people he met as, quote, willingly trading everything they owned, being, quote, well built. Um, they would make fine servants with 50 men. We could subjugate them all and make them do whatever we want. Uh, first of all, screw you, Columbus. And second, okay, let's think about the intended audience. I mean, we could do purpose. We could do point of view. There's a lot of things we could do here, but for right now, we look at, like, he write, he's writing this in his captain's log, and a lot of students will say, okay, well, his intended audience was himself. It's just, like, his own kind of memos and his own notes. And it's like, mm, do we really think that Columbus, who is kind of just discovering this whole new land, he really thinks no one's going to read his captain's log, right? And so we can think about, okay, who, who would probably want to read his captain's log? Well, probably other explorers, other conquistadors that might want to join his voyages, or also like the government of Spain, the people who gave him the money to like see, okay, what did you do? What did you find? Like, was this worth it? And so again, if his intended audience is either other explorers or people to fund more voyages for him, then that makes sense that he would be describing how basically easily conquerable these people are. Because again, we're kind of throwing in a little bit of purpose, but it's like he's wanting the king and queen or the other explorers or whoever to know like, this is gonna be worth our time. You're gonna get more bang for your buck. Um, stick with me, keep funding me. Um, and I think this place is gonna be super easy to conquer, right? I already kind of mentioned it, but um, I really always encourage, well, let's talk about purpose. I will say purpose is the one the students miss the most. They just get it wrong. <laughs> and so I, my tip that I'm gonna talk about more in a second is to typically encourage students like to do purpose with the intended audience or purpose with point of view, but doing purpose on its own is often kind of difficult. But here's a document where we could talk about that. So this is an account of the first meeting between Montezuma and Hernan Cortez, but it's told by the Aztecs to a Spanish historian who's writing it down and it's told in the 1520s. So this is a secondary account and it's really a tertiary account, right? This is Aztecs like remembering their recollections of this thing and telling it to a Spanish person who's then writing it down a few, at least a few years after the conquest actually happened. And that's important, right? So this document is really interesting to me because there are different layers of purpose. So in the document, it basically says that when Cortez arrives in Tenochtitlan, he basically says that Montezuma tells him, you have come to your city, Mexico. You have come here to sit on your throne. So in this narrative, Montezuma is just giving up Tenochtitlan to Cortez. He's like, okay, I, I kept the seat warm for you, but here you go. But like, we all should read that document and go, is that really what he said? Or is that really what he meant? So one, is that really what he meant, right? So the purpose of this might be um, that the Aztecs are trying to understand how they were conquered, right? Like they're trying to tell their narrative in a way that maybe doesn't put the blame on them. It puts the blame on their leader. Right. So their purpose in telling this version of the story to the Spanish historian might be to say, well, we didn't even really put up a fight. Right. He basically just like welcomed them in and he gave them this advantage. And, you know, there was really nothing. There's nothing we could do once the war started, because, again, this is this great Aztec empire that's conquered like the world around them. And then they got conquered relatively easily. And so these Aztecs who are living in this post-conquest era are trying to figure out how it could have happened. So. That might be their reasoning for wanting to explain it in this way. Um, or the Spanish historian might have a purpose for explaining it in this way. He's probably writing and he's part of the official expedition. And so he's wanting to justify what just happened to these people. He's wanting to justify the fact that these like good Catholic Spaniards 
just murdered a bunch of Aztecs. Uh, and so he's doing that maybe by writing down this version of events and saying like, well, he basically kind of welcomed Cortez in. So it was like a, it was basically a binding contract. Um, now, I will just say, this is like a little rant I like to go on because I did my graduate thesis on this exact meeting. Like I did my whole thesis on the meeting between Montezuma and Cortez. Um, most historians understand this. If he did say this, Montezuma, welcome to your city. Um, he was saying it like colloquially. He was, it was a diplomatic thing to say. He was basically saying, mi casa es su casa. Like as long as you're here, you're welcome. If you're here, you're family, right? It's like the Olive Garden. And so, you know, that's obviously if he did say it and he said it in that way, that's getting misconstrued over time and then used to justify potentially the conquest of this empire. Ooh, there's like so many levels to this document. Okay, again, my tip is that students get purpose wrong a lot. They say they're talking about the purpose, but they really just summarize the document. So students, for example, will say for this Columbus letter, they'll be like, the purpose of the letter is to tell people that the indigenous people are well built, are well built and will make fine servants. And it's like, well, no, you're just saying, we just, you're just saying what the document said, but what's the purpose of him saying what he said, right? It's a little more meta than that. Or they might say, okay, the purpose of this document is for the historians to document what happened when Montezuma and Cortez first met. And you're like, no, that's just, that's just what it is. But we want to know, like, why is it the way it is? Again, purpose is really meta and it, it really like messes with kids and they, it's hard for them to get, which is why I kind of encourage you to just like lump it in as part of either your intended audience or your point of view, because that makes it a little bit easier. Okay, the last one is point of view. I think this is the one the students are the most familiar with. So if students are stuck, I encourage them to try point of view, especially if they see a document that is made by or written by a historical figure they know. So if it's a letter by Columbus or it's a portrait commissioned by Akbar or whoever, or if you know the AP exam just kind of tells you who this person is, which is what this document is. So this source is an engraving by a Protestant who was banished from the Spanish Netherlands. And he's made this engraving of natives working in the silver mine at Potosi. And like students will look at this and see, this looks really dark. It looks really brutal. The men look totally naked. This, this looks really terrible. It looks like these people are being seriously mistreated. Okay, um, one, that's true. That is what's happening in these silver mines. But we can still look at the point of view and see why might he be wanting to make an engraving of this event, of this terrible dark event. And so students will, will notice a few things. Well, he's a Protestant. Okay, well, Spain is Catholic. And so if he's a Protestant, he has some incentive to want to show like the Catholic monarchy and the Catholic state as, you know, less Christianly, Christianly, you know, less Christian than he is. You know what I mean? Um, but there's even another layer of point of view is that he's from the Spanish Netherlands and he was banished from there. So the Spanish Netherlands, right? Are this place that is subjugated by Spain. There's a lot of Protestants. They are at this time kind of pushing for independence. Uh, he, in theory, was probably banished from there because he might have been one of those people. And so he has like many different identities that all are teaching him to not like Spain and to want to take down Spain, whether that's as a Protestant or as someone who lived in the Netherlands and then was banished from there. And so again, all of these points of view are combining together to say like, that makes sense that he would choose of all the things he could engrave to engrave this terrible scene of mistreatment by the Spanish, right? Um, and again, the, the thing I always try to emphasize with kids because I do think this is where we can really help them out just as like full, well-rounded citizens is teaching them that just because we identify some quote unquote problem with the document, maybe we identify like, oh, well he was biased against the Spanish or whatever, that doesn't make this document invalid. We can't, we don't cancel this document, right? It's still really useful. We still need to keep it around, but we just need to like look at it through this screen and understand that like there are reasons why he made these choices. Not that this event now is fake and just didn't happen, but it's like, we should know that, okay, this is from the point of view of someone who has a lot of reasons to not like this Spanish. So the last thing I'll leave you with is just that the question you should be asking your students over and over and over again, whenever they hip stuff is so what? So if they say something like the point of view is from a Protestant, uh, he was probably, you know, probably didn't like the Spanish. Okay, so you've identified the point of view. And then what I write over and over again in, the, in essays when I'm, when I'm grading them is I put dot, 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 and so, 
question mark, right? Because I want them to say, and so, right? This document may be um, an attempt to take down the Spanish monarch or whatever, right? They got to tell us like why we care about the context or why we care about the intended audience. So it's how does it help us better understand something in the document? How does it help us read between the lines, um, identify maybe some information that's missing, that sort of thing. Whew, okay, that was a long one, but this is a this is a big one. Again, I think this is the most important thing that we teach our kids all year. So um, start this early. Again, I think this is the kind of thing that just, it comes with time. Like students just need to see this and do this over and over again. Keep in mind, they don't always have to write it and it doesn't always have to be in DBQ. This is one of those skills that could be a warm up. You just put a document up and say, all right, pick two of the four hips and do them really quickly. Um, this could just be a really simple, literally whole day class activity, right? You can you can take any old DBQ, take out the seven documents and just give them around to different groups um, and have them just fully hip the document, do as many as they can, and then kind of share around. Like there's a lot of ways you can do this creatively that's not just having them write a million DBQs. Um, and again, that's gonna help them in many ways because obviously the multiple choice are all stimulus based too. So the more historical documents we're getting them to look at and understand, the better prepared they're gonna be. Okay, so with that, um, how you can support me, because it's just me. People have been sending me emails about like to the anti-social studies team, which is like really adorable because it's just me in my guest room. But how you can support me, you can follow me on Instagram at anti-social studies. I just joined TikTok. We'll see how long that lasts, but it's really fun so far at anti-social studies. If you really wanna directly support me, I would really love for you to go join my Patreon community at patreon.com slash anti-social studies. You can join for as little as $1 a month and get like tons of bonus teaching materials for my website. But if you join for $3 or more a month, you get extra episodes. I do a lot of current events. I'll, I'll share kind of mini 10 or 15 minute podcast episodes of me explaining current events or kind of giving my views on it, that sort of thing. So if you like what I'm doing and find this helpful, I would really love for you to join my Patreon so that I can keep doing more of it. Thanks.